Hi, I'm Buriana. Welcome to my channel Art Unplugged. On the 31st of May, one of the most prominent artists of our time, Christo, passed away. I dedicate this video to him. Christo, who worked in tandem with his wife Jean-Claude, is best known for wrapping things, from chairs and sofas and boxes to the Reichstag in Berlin or Pont Neuf in Paris. And later this year, posthumously, the Arc de Triomphe. In this video, I'm going to try to unwrap Christo for you and give you my personal angle on his art. Let's see. Christo was born in Bulgaria in 1935. His father owned a fabric factory, so Christo and his two brothers spent a lot of time there, fascinated by the colors and the textures. Some of those drawings, very early drawings, pencil and paper, are very touching because they show the textile factory owned by Christo's father. And Christo, as a small boy, would go in the factory and draw all those textiles, big machinery. <laughs> Imagine! And he, little did, did he know that his entire life would be spent <laughs> with textile. <laughs> his parents' social circles involved artists and intellectuals, and Christo grew up surrounded by progressive ideas. In 1944, though, following a Soviet-backed communist coup in Bulgaria, things changed. The factory was nationalized, his father was later imprisoned as an enemy of the people, the fate of many like him. In the early 50s, Christo enrolled in the Fine Art Academy in Sofia, where he stood out with his superb drawing skills. But the 50s weren't a nice time in Stalinist Bulgaria. It's really hard to imagine. To make it easy on you, try to think of North Korea today, but on a smaller scale. The mandate of the Art Academy was to train artists in the spirit of the Soviet social realism. Things like these. For the professors there, art history ended with the post-impressionists. After that, everything was considered decadent and retrogressive. In 1955, Christo had an opportunity to go to Prague, and when he arrived there, he was flabbergasted in his own words. This, compared to Bulgaria, was Europe. He forayed in theatre design and was exposed for the first time to the works of Matisse, Miró, Kandinsky. In the wake of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, Christo fled to Vienna, hiding in a freight train. He stayed briefly there, then in Geneva and eventually, in 1958, ended up in Paris. Penniless and not speaking a word of French, he made his living doing manual jobs and painting portraits on the street. In Paris, he got involved with the Nouveau Realists, a French avant-garde movement with elements of conceptualism and pop art. Those were the times, after all. It was then when he started his first experiments with wrapping various objects, furniture, beer cans, motorcycles, road signs. Now, you would rightly ask, how is a wrapped chair art? And, in my opinion, it is more amparte. If you don't know what I mean by amparte, you should watch my video on the subject, which I've linked in the description below. However, Christo didn't leave it at that. He went further. For him, that was the starting point of a thought process around the notion of transforming objects and from their spaces. As an artist, I can see now how the idea of wrapping comes directly from drawing. When you're learning to draw something, you first situate it in space as a mass, as a rough outline, and then gradually start to carve in the details. You unwrap the shape and the details. The same applies to landscape, of course. But what if you reverse the process? And instead of doing it on a canvas, apply it to the elements of the landscape on a monumental scale. 
In good art, there is always a conflict, an underlying tension between its elements, which is what makes it exciting. This conflict can be in the shapes, in the lines, in colors, in textures, in the balance of the composition, an exaggeration here, an omission there. It is harder to spot in classical art because it's more subtle there and you need to know what to look for. More evident in modern art. But in any case, the creativity of an artist is in creating this kind of conflict, this kind of tension. Without it, all we have is a postcard or a mugshot if it's a portrait. In Christos' work, the conflict is on many levels. First, we are not prepared to see interventions in the landscape or cityscape which are not architecture or agriculture. Then, is their sheer scale and extent? These works are not in the landscape, the landscape is in them. Last but not least comes their temporary ephemeral character, opposed to the investment in money and effort that's gone in them. This is something that the mind struggles with. In October 1958, Christo met Jean-Claude, his future wife and art partner. He was commissioned to paint a portrait of her mother. Jean-Claude and Christo are born on the same day, as if destined to share an incredible journey. Their first show together is in Cologne in 61, when they showcase the three types of artworks which they will be known for. Wrapped items, all barrels and large-scale ephemeral works. By 1964, when they move to New York, they have already built a name to themselves. And from this point onwards, their projects will become even more outlandish and grandiose. I cannot list all of them, but I want to show you some of the most striking ones. The wrapped Reichstag, a hundred thousand square meters of thick fabric with an aluminium surface and 15.6 kilometers of rope. It took 25 years to complete. The surrounded islands in Florida, done in 1983. The umbrellas revealed simultaneously in two valleys in California and Japan. The gates, 7,503 of them in Central Park in New York City, completed in February 2005 after 26 years from inception. The Valley Curtain in Colorado, my personal favorite. And the most recent one, the Floating Piers in June 2016, in Italy's Lake Iseo. To say that these projects are ambitious or even grand would be an understatement. They took years, decades to realize, millions of dollars, thousands of experts, workers, specialists, long hours of negotiations with local authorities, uh, public organizations, owners of properties, and so on. Only to be installed, kept for a couple of weeks, then dismantled and recycled. During their work together, over 50 years, Christo and Jean-Claude managed to realize 23 projects and 47 more remained unrealized. The interesting thing is that these massive projects were entirely self-funded by Christo and Jean-Claude through the sale of sketches, blueprints and 3D models. Through the years, they also amassed a collection of their own work, which they could use as collateral and receive credit lines from the banks. The couple remained adamant in not allowing any influencers to interfere with their work. So they were not represented by agents or galleries, did not accept donations, sponsorship money, advertising money, didn't charge any admissions or any licensing fees. Yeah. You know that artists make drawings or paintings and sell, and like sell that. them and with I the money they I've buy what that. they want a diamond for their wife or a house in the country Certainly instead do. with our money we build projects Christo is different only in the way he spends his money because he spends it not the usual way which you all admit is perfect if I if he were to buy me a four million dollar diamond this would be perfectly all right but I don't happen to like diamonds I prefer to have the gates project, or a running fence, or a valley curtain. To understand all this, you have to look at the Christo Jean-Claude phenomenon as a complex whole, involving their aesthetics, their uncompromising values, 
their unique business model which allowed them to remain independent from the art market and basically do what they want. Because the end product is all of that, not just the physical installation. Christo and Jean-Claude like to say that the single purpose of their creations was beauty, that they have no other meaning or message, that they're useless, aimless, pointless, and the world can do perfectly well without them. But was that really what they meant? I think that what they meant was that they didn't want to impose any interpretation on the viewer, that the viewer is free to interpret them any way he or she wants. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, art is in his mind. So what is the meaning of Christo and Jean-Claude's work for me? What do their creations tell me? First, that art is for all of us and nobody can own it. Whether it's the Sultan of Brunei or a poor man, both can take a selfie in front of one of their installations, but no one can own it. Christo and Jean-Claude made us all equal. They give me the belief that the wildest dreams can be made true, no matter how unthinkably crazy or outlandish they are. Because when we look at art, we subconsciously identify ourselves with what we see. Instead of thinking of art as a picture hanging on the wall, why not go beyond the wall and see that art can be bigger than the walls that we build around us and inside of us? Compared to nature, we humans and everything that we do are ephemeral. Like Jean-Claude liked to say, that their installations are like a rainbow. The fact that it is temporary makes it even more exciting. And how about an immigrant boy from Bulgaria and an upper-class French girl fall in love? And 24 years later, they make the Reichstag vote for its own wrapping. All that in a spirit of complete equality. And how about the freedom to do with your life what you want in your own terms? What could be a more universal yearning? The ginormous, crazy installations of Christo and Jean-Claude are telling us all this. And if creativity, passion, intelligence, resilience, love is not enough to give meaning to art, I don't know what is. I hope you found this video interesting. Please like it, share and don't forget to subscribe. If you have been lucky enough to see a work of Christo and Jean-Claude in reality, please tell me about it, because I haven't. I would love to hear your story. Thanks for watching and I will see you very soon. Bye.